Turn with me, please, in your Bibles at this time to the Gospel of Mark. And this time, chapter 15, Mark 15. That would be what? Page 60. Page 41 in the Pew Bible. Mark chapter 15. Over the past several Lord's Days, we have been opening up these final chapters of the Gospel of Mark, looking at the events depicted in this concise Gospel. It's a very compact and very concise Gospel. You remember that Mark often says, immediately this happened, immediately that happened, and immediately that happened. Many times he says that in this short gospel. Very concise, very compact. And what we've been looking at recently, beginning in chapter 14, are the events that took place prior to, and then including, his death on the cross at Golgotha. From chapter 14, we saw the anointing of Jesus for his burial, done by Mary the sister of Martha and Lazarus, anointing him and his body. Even for that time, he would be crucified and buried. During all that he went through in those days, the aroma from that very costly and very uh, pungent, very strong perfume would have been with him, reminding him of why he was going to the cross save those who he loved. We went then and considered the celebrating of the Passover and the initiating of the Lord's Supper. We also went on to look at the sifting of the disciples. And then as we turned to Jesus in Gethsemane, we saw the agonizing of Jesus before the cross. Two weeks ago, we considered the betraying of Jesus by Judas, seen in chapter 15 in verses 43 and following. And there, from there we went on to see the trying of Jesus by sinners as he was held before these kangaroo courts. I remind you that there were six different trials and two outcomes. Three trials by the Jews, Three trials by the Romans. The Jews find him guilty, and Caesar said, I find no guilt in this man. Six trials, two, out, two results, but only one outcome. And that outcome was that he was turned over to be crucified. And that's what we looked at last Lord's Day. Last Lord's Day, we considered the sacrificing of Jesus for our sins. And that again coming from chapter 15 in verse 22 and following. And we saw here in the text what we call the mocking. The mocking of Jesus. That actually occurring prior to his crucifixion. In verse 16, the soldiers took him away into the place that is the praetorium. And they called together a whole Roman cohort, approximately 500 soldiers. And they dressed him in purple and twisted a crown of thorns and put it on him. Just horrible beating, horrible treatment. We talked about the treatment and called it the degrading nature of the treatment that he underwent by these men. They treated him like he was the village idiot with scorn and disdain. They mocked him. They spit in his face. They beat him over the head. They kneeled down and bowed before him, mocking him as the king. In other parallel texts, we find that they said, prophesy, who is it that punched you? And so the face of our Lord would have been beaten and battered and bloody from the crown of thorns, and bloody from the punching, no doubt, in his nose 
and in other places. And then we backed up and looked not only at the degrading nature of how they treated them, the unholy nature of how they treated them. Because this was the Son of God. This was blasphemy in the highest as they treated him so poorly. The mocking that took place was blasphemous and unholy. We then considered the beating of our Lord. And even from verse 15, the scourging of our Lord. Wishing to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas for them. And ha after having Jesus scourged, he handed him over to be crucified. The scourging, we're not told exactly how it was done in the New Testament, in the Gospels. But we know what it was like, how they would take him and tie his arms to a pole or to a wall, lay him out, and these men would come, sometimes more than one, one on each side, would take a whip with pieces of bone or pieces of metal, and they would rip the flesh off of his back, sometimes exposing the muscle or even the bone. It was a horrible treatment. And this is what they did to our Lord, to our Savior. And so the mocking, the beating, the scourging, and then, of course, the crucifying. Once again, we see in the text that it says, as it does in all the Gospels, almost matter-of-factly, in verse 24, and they crucified him. And they crucified him. That's all that it says. The New Testament doesn't even tell us what crucifixion was. We only know from history and archaeology. Archaeology shows us the uh, wrists and hands of someone who had been crucified. And the spike was not here, as people sometimes think. It was here. Which included the hand in the Greek understanding. But here, you see, the spike would hold up the person on the cross. Here, it would, your hand would just slide through. The weight would just pull it out. But here, inside the bones, it would keep it up there. Keep you up there. And so they would drive the spike through the wrist and nail it into a beam. Raise the cross or raise the beam up. And then they would nail the feet. And the only way that a person being crucified could breathe was if they would push up on that painful spiked feet and catch a breath. that's why they broke the legs of the other two because that would mean they couldn't push up and catch a breath and they would sat, suffocate but our Lord they did not break his bones he had died he had given up his life already we talked about the crucifixion we talked about the fact that it was just a terrible horrible death there on that place called Golgotha it was a sadistic deed, a horrible death. And yet we find it depicted hundreds of years before in Psalm 22. And we're at Psalm 22, the psalmist writes about one being crucified as plain as day. What it was like and what it meant. And there in Psalm 22, he even talks about casting lots for his garment. And those who were standing by and mocking him. And here in the Gospel of Mark, we have exact fulfillment of that hundreds of years later. Psalm 22 was written hundreds of years before crucifixion was even invented. And now here, hundreds of years later, it happens exactly as he said. As we see here on the uh, verse 24 they crucified him and divided up his garments among themselves, casting lots for them to decide what each man should take. And then those who were walking by, mocking him, deriding him, just as depicted in Psalm 22. So that was the sadistic deed. We also looked at some of the supernatural events. 
We read here in uh, uh, verse 25 that it was the third hour when they crucified him. That would have been 9 a.m. in the morning. The third hour. 9 o'clock. That's when they crucified our Lord. And from there, we see in verse 33, when the sixth hour came, darkness fell over the whole land. That would have been noon, 12 o'clock. And there was this felt inexplicable darkness. Some people liken it to an eclipse, but it was more than that. It was the very presence of the wrath of God as he poured out his wrath upon his son as he hung on the cross. And Jesus took the punishment for our sins from God the Father himself. That's what the darkness depicted. The darkness that was there. So from 3 o'clock, uh, so from the 6th hour, the whole land had this darkness until the ninth hour. The ninth hour would have been 3 o'clock. And at the ninth hour, we hear that Jesus cried out, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani which is translated, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then, our Lord Jesus, in verse 37, uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. They did not kill him. You cannot kill God. He gave up his life. He breathed his last. And when he had done that, the veil in the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, signifying our access to God the Father, and signifying that there are no more sacrifices needed. The high priest did not have to go into that Holy of Holies once a year anymore and sprinkle blood on the altar. No more! It's done. It's finished. Christ was the final sacrifice. There is no more sacrificing necessary. And these denominations that continue to carry on in so-called sacrificing of Jesus are blaspheming as Christ's accomplishment on the cross met the needs to save us. And there is no need to continue any more sacrifices as Christ accomplished redemption for his people. What they're saying is what Jesus did was not enough. And yet we know that it is. He gave his life once for all on the cross. No more sacrifices. The temple has been rent. We have access to God the Father through Christ Christ. Jesus our Lord. And then we have in verse 39 the centurion who was standing right in front of him. And he saw the way he breathed his last and said, Truly this man was the Son of God. Here's a centurion who was likely involved in the mocking, the beating, the scourging. He was right there, right part of it, no doubt. Certainly, he was involved in the crucifixion. And yet this man attested to the fact that Jesus was indeed the Son of God. Now we have the burying. The mocking, the beating, the scourging, the crucifying, the dying, and the burying. In verse 42, when evening had already come, because it was a preparation day, that is the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea came, a prominent member of the council, who himself was waiting for the kingdom of God. He gathered up courage and went in before Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate wondered if he was dead by this time. And some in the centurion, he questioned him as to whether he was already dead. Do you realize 
that this was an execution by the government. They had to know. They had to have records. Documents had to be signed. And so Pilate, being the governor, wanted to know if he was dead. So what does he do? He sends men out to find out. And what did they find out? He was dead. Jesus died. Jesus was not half dead, almost dead, and came alive when they put him in the tomb. He was dead. It is an official record of the government, the Roman government, as Pilate said, find out if he's dead. And these men knew they better not be wrong. And so they came and reported to Pilate that he was dead. Verse 45, ascertaining this from the centurion, he granted the body to Joseph. Joseph brought a linen cloth, took him down, wrapped him in the linen cloth, and laid him in the tomb, which had been hewn out of the rock, and then rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother, mother of Joseph were looking in on to see where he was laid. So Jesus was buried. He died and he was buried. The day that Jesus died was Friday. He died approximately 3 o'clock. Now in the Jewish frame of time and days, that was three hours before sunset. Pretty much the day ended at sunset or the sixth hour. So he would have, um, the six o'clock, I'm sorry, 6 p.m. So Jesus would have died and been in the tomb at least three hours, even in the Jewish terminology of the day, one day. Any part of a day constituted a day. He would have been in the tomb all day on Saturday, the Sabbath. And then he would have been in the tomb again, assuming that six o'clock was the end of the day for the Jews. He was raised from the dead approximately 6 a.m. in the morning. So that's 12 hours, three days, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, fulfilling exactly the prophecies and fulfilling exactly what Jesus said would happen. So Jesus was dead and Jesus was buried, leading up to today. Today, the first day of the week, the third day, Jesus had been dead. And so now we turn, after seeing the anointing of Jesus for burial, the celebrating of the Passover, the sifting of the disciples, the agonizing of Jesus before the cross, the betraying of Jesus by Judas, the trying of Jesus by sinners, the sacrificing of Jesus for our sins. Today we have the raising of Jesus from the dead. And this begins in chapter 16 of the Gospel of Mark, that passage that we read a few moments ago. And what I'm going to do here is to divide this up in just a couple of firsts. A couple of firsts. And the first first is that it was the first day of the week. Verse 1 tells us, when the Sabbath was over. Now you understand that to the Jew, the whole week revolved around the Sabbath. And it is my understanding that they didn't exactly even have names for the days of the weeks like we do. What they had was the first day after the Sabbath, the second day after the Sabbath, or the day before the Sabbath. Because it all revolved around the Sabbath. And so this tells us when the Sabbath was over. And if you go on and look at verse 2, very early on the first day of the week. So the Sabbath is over. It's the first day of the week. The first day 
being what we celebrate or call as Sunday. Today. This, of course, a special Sunday. But every Sunday is a celebration of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That is why the Christian church meets on Sunday. The Christian church was meeting on Sunday almost immediately following the resurrection of Jesus. It was the pattern that Jesus set for them as he appeared to them on Sunday. And he appeared to them again on Sunday, the first day of the week. And so the first day of the week is the day that we meet together and celebrate the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. That's why we meet on Sunday. Now, there are some who suggest that to be consistent with the law of Moses and the Old Testament, that Christians should meet on Saturday. They have a name for these people. They have, they're very popular and they own hospitals. <laughs> Seventh-day Adventists. And they claim that to be consistent with the Old Testament, the church should meet on Saturday, the seventh day. But what they fail to realize is that we are not under the Old Covenant. And besides, the law of Moses is not what designated the day of rest. It was a creation ordinance. In Genesis chapter 1, we are told that God created the earth and all that is in it in six days. In Genesis chapter 2, on the seventh day, he rested. So the one in seven is not from Moses. Moses gets it from creation. It is a creation ordinance. And the creator of heaven and earth, who gave his life on Friday was raised from the dead on Sunday and established that day as the day that we worship God. That day is the day that we set aside to worship. And so from the beginning of Christianity, the church has gathered to meet on Sunday and to experience to exalt and to honor God as creator and sustainer and redeemer on the Lord's Day, on Sunday. In fact, if you look in your Bibles real quick to Acts, look at Acts chapter 20. This is still, wow, the apostles were, were doing things and before the Bible had been completed and while they're still writing these accounts that are going on, still so early, early on in the church, chapter 20 in the book of Acts in verse 7, on the first day of the week when we gathered together to break bread, Paul began talking to them. That's sort of like what we do right now. We meet on the first day of the week and one comes and brings word from God's word. The first day of the week. In fact, look at Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. I won't turn to all the passages. I just wanted these two. Revelation chapter 1. This is the uh, vision, of course, of John the Revelator. He says in verse 9, I, John, your brother and fellow partaker in the tribulation and kingdom and perseverance which are in Jesus was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Before the Bible was even complete, the church was so used to meeting on Sunday that it was already called the Lord's Day and has been ever since. We call Sunday the Lord's Day because Christ 
rose from the dead on the first day of the week, that day that we call Sunday. Now back to our text. It is the day that our Savior has risen, and that is why we gather to worship on Sundays. It's a special day. For so many of us, of course, just as the Jewish year, Jewish week, I should say, revolved around the Sunday, the Sabbath day, Saturday, Christians' lives revolve around Sunday. We are so thankful to come and meet together and hear God's word on Sunday. So thankful that we can be those who gather together and remember the resurrection of Christ from the dead every Sunday. This, of course, a special Sunday. When you think about it, those disciples, those Jewish disciples, were so used to everything revolving around the Sabbath, and they changed, and everything began to revolve around Sunday, the first day of the week. Because that was the day that Christ was raised from the dead. That was a, a dramatic, huge change in their life. Their lifestyle. For some of you, Sunday was just another day. Another day to do work. Another day to go shopping. Another day to go to the beach. Another day off. It's my only day off. That's what so many people say. But for Christians, it's a special day. It's the day we remember that Christ rose from the dead. And I want to thank you for coming to church and worshiping on Sunday. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being a part of a church that worships on the Lord's Day. So many churches now have services on Saturday night, so you don't have to worry about it. Just go to some kind of so-called church at 4 o'clock, and you get out at 4.45, and you're done. You know, you don't have to worry about it for the rest of the week. Is that all Christianity means to people? Putting in 45 minutes so I don't have to worry about God anymore for the rest of the week? For us, it's the center of our lives. Worshiping God. Thanking God for Christ and remembering His resurrection. I thank you for worshiping, identifying yourselves with Christ on the first day of the week. It is not very common today. Statistics came out just this past week how church attendance is way down. Those who call themselves Protestants, down like 8 or 9 percent from just a few years ago. People identify more with being nothing. That particular category has been increasing exponentially. Nothing. They may believe in God. They don't go to church. They don't affiliate with any church. Thank you for being here. Thank you for worshiping. Now, I've taken way too much time on this first first. I'm going to move to the second first. It was the first day of the week. I want to look now at the first ones to the tomb. The first ones to the tomb. Now, all of the Gospels record that the first ones to come to the tomb were women. Women who were caring for Jesus. Women who were ministering to Jesus women who helped Jesus all throughout his ministry. They were kind of in the background, but you read about them here and there. They were always around, caring for him, even giving money to support him. By the way, Mary and Martha were like that. They were obviously, obviously a wealthy family. And they helped Jesus and his ministry. And we even read about Martha preparing the dinner for Jesus and the disciples. And Martha gets upset that Mary's not helping her. But, but Martha helped. Martha and the women were always around helping and ministering to Jesus. 
And here verse 1 tells us that there were several women who came to the tomb. And I'm going to look at the ones that are written here. The first one mentioned is Mary Magdalene. That's verse 1 of chapter 16. Now, Mary was a Galilean woman from the city of Magdala. That's where we learn about her. Turn, if you would, please, back to Luke chapter 8. Or forward to Luke chapter 8. And here we have the account of what happened to Mary Magdalene. Now, this is not Mary the sister of Martha and Lazarus. This is a different woman. This is Mary Magdalene. So here in chapter 8 of the Gospel of Luke, we read about what happened with this <coughs> woman. Just in verses 1 and 2, soon afterwards he began going around from one city and village to another, proclaiming and preaching the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him. Also some of the women who had been healed of evil spirits and sickness. Mary, who was called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out. This talks a little bit more about the women who were there. It speaks about Joanna, the wife of Cusa, and these, these women. But Mary Magdalene was one from whom seven demons were cast out. Back to chapter 15 of, uh, of chapter 16 of Matt, I'm sorry, Mark. No, actually, I did want to look at chapter 15. I should listen to myself. Back to chapter 15 of Mark, we see that she was one of those who witnessed the burial. In verse 40 of chapter 15, there were also some women looking on from a distance, among whom were Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James the Less and Josie, and Salome. So these were the women that were looking on and seeing where Jesus was buried. They saw him die, and they came up and saw where he was buried. So now, chapter 16, verse 1 still, Mary Magdalene was one of those. She was the one who saw where Jesus was crucified, saw where Jesus was buried. We read in John chapter 20 that this Mary was the Mary who first spoke to Jesus after his resurrection. Chapter 20 of the Gospel of John. Verse 1. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came early to the tomb while it was still dark and saw the stone already taken away from the tomb. So she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and said to them, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. We know that Peter and John ran to the tomb. They looked inside. They did not see Jesus, and so they went their way. But Mary did not leave. Verse 11, Mary was standing outside the tomb weeping. And so as she wept, she stooped and looked in the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and one at the feet, where the body of Jesus had been lying. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. And when she said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni which means teacher. And Jesus said to her, Stop clinging to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but, to the, but go to my brethren and say to them, I ascend to my Father and to your Father and to my God and to your God. So Mary was not only 
one of the first ones at the tomb, she was the first one to whom Jesus spoke after his resurrection. Mary being the first one that Jesus spoke to there at the tomb. Now this was most unusual in the, old, the New Testament era, in this time period, that a woman would be the first one to bring news. Women were in the background. Men did this stuff. But here in the Gospels, in all four Gospels, unashamedly the Gospels say that it was the women to whom Jesus first appeared. He appeared, or they found out that the tomb was empty first. And they were the first ones to bring the news. This shows the honesty of the Bible. There's nothing hidden. There's nothing twisted around to make it culturally correct. Can't do that anymore. Everything has to be culturally correct today. But they were honest. They brought the truth. Yes, it was women who first saw the tomb empty. It was a woman to whom Jesus first spoke. Back in our text, we read about two other women. In chapter 16 and verse 1, it speaks also of Mary, the mother of James. Now, this would have been the one spoken of in verse 40 of chapter 15, James the Less, or James the Lesser, as he is sometimes called. And the reason that he would have been called James the Lesser is likely because his father's name was James. And so he would have been James the Lesser, the son. We don't do it quite that way today. I don't call my son Michael, Michael the Lesser. Michael the Second. But we do have the understanding that that is likely why he was called James the Lesser. And he was also a follower of Jesus. She was one who was noted as ministering to him, and one that would have followed after him. And the text also mentions this woman, Salome. And she and these all these women brought spices to anoint Jesus, but Salome is also one who was uh, the mother of James, and John, the sons of Zebedee. So she would have been married to Zebedee. That's who Salome was, the mother of James and John, the followers of Jesus. Now other passages mention uh, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Joanna, the wife of Cusa. But these are the ones who would come and minister to Jesus. These are the ones that uh, saw Jesus buried, and these are the ones who were the first ones to arrive at the tomb and see the tomb was empty. The third first. The first day of the week, the first ones to the tomb, and the first evidence of his resurrection. The first evidence that Jesus was not in the tomb. Now we often speak of the empty tomb of Jesus. The tomb is empty. But when we look here, we see in verse 2, very early on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. And they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away, although it was extremely large. Entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting at the right, wearing a white robe, and they were amazed. So the tomb wasn't empty. Now, it was empty of Jesus. Jesus had been raised from the dead. We also just read in John chapter 20 that Mary Magdalene looked in the tomb and also saw an angel. The angels were all around that day. All around. And here's an angel sitting at the right hand, wearing a white robe. And they were amazed. And he said to them, do not be amazed. You're looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who has been crucified. He has risen. He is not here. So the angels announced to the women that he was risen from the dead. That's the first evidence that he was raised from the dead. The tomb, the stone rolled away, the angel announcing 
the resurrection of our Lord from the dead. Now it speaks about the women here being amazed. Do not be amazed. They were amazed. I would put forth to you that the angels were amazed. You know, the angels long to look into these things, the scripture tells us. And here we have angels. Angels who announced that Mary would be with child. Angels who announced to the shepherds the birth of Jesus in, in Bethlehem. Angels who announced these things. Angels present and ministering to Jesus in the when he was out in the wilderness. Angels ministering to Jesus in Gethsemane. And now angels gathered around this tomb. Witnesses, eyewitnesses to the resurrection of the one they knew to be the Son of God. Witnesses to his resurrection. But now, of course, the main point here is indeed that the tomb was void of Jesus. He had been raised. They saw him buried here. They returned here. And he's not there. He's been raised from the dead. This was the first evidence of his resurrection. Now, as I said to you earlier, this is really where the Gospel of Mark ends. The rest of the Gospel of Mark is good, but it was likely not included in the, in the original document. And as I said to you, the best understanding that we have is a well-meaning scribe who had already perhaps read Luke and read Matthew and read the Gospel of John and possibly even read the book of Acts, and he knew all of these things, and perhaps the second century added in these uh, things. And it's not that these are bad, and it's not that we should avoid them, but we don't make doctrine necessarily of the last verses in the Gospel of Mark. But we will see that he says here in verse 9, after he had risen early on the first day of the week, he first appeared to Mary Magdalene, on whom he had cast out the seven demons, Probably got that from the Gospel of John. Verse 10, she went forth and reported these things who had been with him while they were mourning and weeping. And when they heard that he was alive and had seen by her, they refused to believe it. And had been, she had, he had been seen by her, they refused to believe it. And after that, he appeared in different form to two of them while they were walking along. That's likely from the Gospel of Luke while Jesus was on the Emmaus Road. All of these things are true. All of these things happen. And we know from the other scriptures, the other texts that we have in the Gospels, that Jesus was indeed raised from the dead. And we have his first appearance before the disciples. In chapter 24 of the Gospel of Luke, he meets with his disciples on the Emmaus Road. We also have, if you wouldn't mind looking there, in Luke chapter 24, what we saw out on the church property a little while ago. He meets with his disciples. He even breaks bread with his disciples in Luke chapter 24. Jesus stands in front of them and in verse 38 says, Why are you troubled and why... Do doubts arise in your heart? See my hands and see my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for I am not a spirit. A spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And they still could not believe it because of their joy and amazement. And he asked them if they had anything to eat. And he ate. So we know that Jesus was manifested before his disciples. He was raised from the dead. In the Gospel of Matthew that Daniel read for us earlier, it says that he appeared to more than 500 at one time. That's in 1 Corinthians. But that was likely the place 
And I want to actually close by looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the Apostle Paul tells us about those who saw Christ raised from the dead. And he says to us that Christ was buried and raised the first day, the third day rather, according to the scriptures. That's chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians and verse 4. Verse 5 says that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, and after he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have died. Then he appeared to James and to all the apostles. And last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. This is the testimony of the church. That Christ died, was buried, and then he was raised on the third day. And he appeared to all these people. 500 people at one time. That's a good sized church. And they all saw him. This is the testimony of the resurrection of Christ. His appearances before the disciples. And I want to close by seeing that he was the first fruits. If you look here at verse 20, it's 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20. But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. The first day, the first ones to see him. The first evidence of his resurrection, that's the first fruits. The first fruits mean that Jesus was not the first one to be raised from the dead. He was the first of many who will follow. For he was the first fruits raised from the dead of those who are asleep. In other words, every Christian who is in Christ, will likewise be raised from the dead. He was only the first of much fruit. Every man, woman, boy or girl who is saved by the work of Jesus Christ will also be raised from the dead. The first fruits. We will be those who are the second fruits. The third fruits, the millionth fruit, were those who follow after Christ as he has been raised from the dead. Now this Easter, this is the account we've looked at for the past six weeks given to us in the Gospel of Mark. Very quickly, went through them very concisely, this is what Mark has given to us. And immediately, and these are the things that we've seen. We've seen all of the accounts from these last chapters of the Gospel of Mark, all leading up to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now last Lord's Day I mentioned to those of you who were here that the death of Christ, the sacrificial death of Christ, is a key and central doctrine in the Christian church. It is a key and central doctrine as much as the birth, the incarnation of Christ, the virgin birth. And I said that it is even a central doctrine comparable to the resurrection of Christ. Christ had to die on the cross. It is when he paid for our sins. But were it not for the resurrection, the incarnation would be meaningless. The death of Christ would be meaningless. For he would be a liar. Because he said he would be raised. And God would be a liar. Because he said he would raise his son. Were it not for the resurrection of Jesus. The rest of Christianity would fall apart. It is the cornerstone. The foundation of Christianity. It shows us that everything that Christ said and taught is true. It shows us that everything Christ said he would do, he did. It holds together all of Christianity. It is the cornerstone of our faith. Without the resurrection, we would not even care about his death because he would have been a criminal. We would have thought he was a liar. 
And by the way, we don't celebrate Christ by meeting on Friday, the day he died. We celebrate Christ by meeting on Sunday, the day he was raised. Because it's true. Because it's real. Because all that he said was true. All that he did really happened. He was who he claimed to be. It shows us that he was indeed the Son of God. It shows us that he was indeed the Lamb of God who came to take away the sins of the world. It shows us that his promises are true. It shows us that he has gone to prepare a place for us. That when, that where he is, we will go to be with him. It's all true. There's resurrection from the dead. We know it. Because Christ was the first fruits. I pray that you will trust in the risen Christ of the scriptures. If you have your trust in him, that it will be strengthened on this day that we celebrate his resurrection. And that when you die, you will live. Even as he said, to Mary and Martha at the tomb of Lazarus. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he die, yet he will live. You will live because Christ rose again from the grave. Hallelujah. What a Savior. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Your Son, O oh God, our Savior Jesus, did so much for us. And how we thank you that he was raised again. We don't mourn Jesus being dead. We celebrate Jesus being alive. Thank you for a risen Savior. Thank you for our faith in him. And thank you for our hope of glory with you because of all of it. And thank you in his name. Amen. Amen. Amen.